Hey everyone, uh, my name's Doodley, and I'm pretty much just like learning shit about science. And due to this intense fascination of mine, I watch many scientific videos ranging from cosmology to biology, and even dabbling in perhaps the most intriguing of all, astrobiology. Now, ordinarily, I'd be fine with watching a video, smacking that thumbs up, adding it to my playlist, and moving on to the next. But for some reason, every time I scroll down, uh, I find, to my dismay, a shitload of raging comments about God, evolution, Jesus, atheism, and occasionally even Islam pops up once or twice. Now, I typically wouldn't give a fuck about inserting myself into this type of argument, but after seeing this same damn discussion resurface thousands of times on videos that I love, I've decided to take some action stop bitching and start educating everyone on exactly what the fuck it is that they're arguing about. And hopefully, while I do this, I can teach some evolution nerds like me a few things that they don't already know, while simultaneously convincing a few agnostics that their suspicions can indeed be verified. So let's start with vestigial structures and what vestigial structures actually are. Vestigial structures refer to an organ or body part that has lost all or most of its function from its original ancestor. Stated simply, they're relics of the past that, if observed, make you go, aw shit, this thing must be related to that thing because both of these things got the same shit. All organisms have ancestors, so every organism carries vestiges from their past, even humans. In this series, we're going to be looking at some vestige, uh, some vestiges one animal at a time. Today's specimen that I've chosen to ramble on about is the lion. But before we begin, we'll have to learn a few things about the actual ancestry of lions in order to fully understand the vestiges that we see. All extinct or non-extinct cats of today are classified within one large known group known as Phalidae. This group can be divided into two subfamilies. Phalinae, not to be confused with Phalidae, with a D, which consists of cheetahs, ocelots, servals, caracals, even domestic cats and other smaller cats. The second subfamily, Pantherinae, consists of most of the larger cats, or big cats, such as tigers, lions, leopards, jaguars, snow leopards, and all sorts of other crazy shit that'll eat your ass. Yeah, this subfamily consists of nearly all of those. Moving on. Now because of this, we can determine that all of these, both smaller cats and larger cats, share a common ancestor dating back to just under 10 million years ago, meaning that all cats are related to one another, kind of like very distant cousins. Actually exactly like very distant cousins. But we won't be going that far. Instead, we're just going to be focusing on the two most closely related species in the Pantherinae family, the jaguars and the lions. Now there's actually a fairly heated discussion going on in the scientific community about whether lions are more closely related to jaguars or to leopards. And because this is such a fierce debate, and both animals are so similar to one another, it makes little difference about who I actually choose to compare because either one is reasonably interchangeable. The first and maybe not so obvious vestigial structure that lions have been carrying around for the past one to two million years are their spots. That's right, my homo habilis looking brethren, lions actually still have remnants of spots from long ago, as you can plainly see. That right there would be a vestigial structure of the fur. It is a relic of the past that indicates that both lions and leopards were once one in the same. A lion's spots usually grow extremely faint once they mature, but in their infancy as cubs, you can see them much more clearly. This may be because cubs that retain their spots throughout their infancy have a higher likelihood of surviving to adulthood rather than infants born without spots. Or it could just be because genes of the past manifest themselves easier during infancy and become more dormant and inactive as the animal ages. But then again, both hypotheses may be wrong and God just overused his eraser. Which also seems fairly plausible. 
Upon further observation, you can actually see that the faint patterns that lion cubs sport are actually identical to those of that of the jaguar. Notice how both lion and jaguar cubs wear rosette markings. You can see them there. They look, they look kind of like little rings. Both have darker markings down the back than on their sides and ribs. The markings go all the way down to their faces also. Those spots don't always come down to the lion cubs faces. Sometimes they just stop at the top of the head. You can even notice the identical type of markings behind the ears. Dark with a, just a little pinch of white going around the edges. Notice the spots going all the way down to the tail. They even share the same identical pattern of little smaller spots that go down the legs. And last but not least, you can see that the lioness also shares a much milder version of her cousin's spots down near her legs and belly. Not a spot elsewhere though, a clear indicator that perhaps thousands of years from now, lions won't be found with spots at all. Spots are now meaningless to lions as they don't seem to enhance the lion's camouflage and hunting cam capabilities anymore. And I say that with emphasis. In fact, spots may just corrupt the lion's success rate as it has moved from hunting in the jungles and the shadows like jaguars and into the open African savanna. In other words, the lion has completely forsaken its past lifestyle for its present and future lifestyle. This picture shows precisely what I mean. Here you can see near perfect camouflage from a lioness who's not even trying to catch some zebra burgers. She's just chilling being just a normal, casual lion. This picture also shows how the dark tail is a dead giveaway as opposed to her uniform sandy color. That's why they try to keep their tails down and out of sight while stalking. The jaguar, however, still, and I emphasize that too, still needs its spots as it frequently hunts between shrubs and bushes. Jaguars benefit greatly from a coat that mimics their pattern of shadows the brush often causes. You'd think that all the vestigial structures stop there, but wrong. The lion's mane? Yeah, that's definitely vestigial. It's actually a recessive gene dating back to all cats' very ancient ancestors, which more than likely sported a little mini mane. It seems as though this recessive mane making gene has resurfaced in lions, and they've been sure to capitalize on it ever since. However, the lion is not the only cat that has turned this recessive gene on. Others have as well, like the lynx, for example, which also flaunts a mane, though maybe not as impressive as the lions, but still very cool. Tigers and cheetahs also grow into adulthood with the tiny makings of a mane occasionally, especially the cheetah's cubs, which have full-blown manes, whereas the adults just have tiny ones. This could very well be an indication as to what adult cheetahs looked like long ago. Male lions with darker, thicker manes presumably get laid a bit more often than those with lighter manes, which is always nice. But the darkness is like torture during some of Africa's hotter days. Well, who wouldn't trade comfort for a bit more cougar action, huh? I mean, what, wouldn't you?